Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, June thirteenth, City Utilities Committee. I am Jason Winston, Chair of the Committee. I am joined to my right by Vice Chair Councilmember Andrea Boone, and to my immediate left, we have Councilmember Jason Dozier. To his left. We have Council Member Dustin Hillis, and on the far left, we have Council Member Howard Shook. At this time, I will uh, accept the motion to adopt the agenda. Second. We have a motion by Shook, second by Hillis. Mr. Johnson, can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The agenda has been adopted. Thank you. And Next, colleagues, I will accept a, a motion to approve the minutes. Second. We have a motion by Shook, a second by Dozier. And please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The minutes have been approved. Thank you. And at this time, we will open it up for public comment. We have any one registered today? Yes, Mr. Chair, we currently we have eight people signed up for our public comment. The first is Michelle Williams. Good. Please, please come to the microphone. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michelle Williams. Um, I'm here with Ms. Patricia for um, People's TV. And what we're doing is we're trying to create new content. So I want to let you know what we do. Me and my husband, we own the Gospel Hip Hop Awards. He has a radio station a network that has 46 stations up under him. The Gospel Hip Hop Awards works with underprivileged youth. And we put them on stage with celebrities that can help create something that they would like to do. We also do a food drive for a 1,000 families. a month. I also have a company called My Kind of Dad. We make three foot tall teddy bear balloons for inmates' children. We get letters from the inmates. We make the three foot tall teddy bear balloons. We give them keepsake boxes and we give them to the children because a lot of times the children are forgotten when parents go to jail. This is something me and my husband do. I'm a few credits away from my um, bachelor's degree. I have a book called Nobody Ever Told Me that deals with sexual, physical, and mental abuse that I've overcome. And I work with children that are suicidal, that have all types of problems. So we want to bring this into Atlanta, we know location is everything. If you're gonna buy gas, you're not gonna buy gas from something that's way back in the woods. But if you're right there on a corner, we're right here in Atlanta, we can hit the heart of the children that are here or the families that are here. We could work with the mothers and the children to kind of get them back on the uh, platform of raising families. Um, we also travel the world. We are foster parents, even though we have our own biological children, we're foster parents and we adopt. So we would like to bring what we have um, to People's TV and offer the platform of television, radio, children, family, and mental stability in the family. And that's what I have to offer today. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I suspect we may have some other um, members of the public who may be speaking to uh, these are public access TV today. And so I yes, think Mr. Sir. Brian Thomas is in the building. I see him um, in the room. He will be speaking to the RFP that's upcoming to this after we have public comment. So I just wanted to make you all aware that we'll, we'll have some additional information after public comment today. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And our next speaker is Mrs. Atkin Atkins. Atkins. Sorry about that. If you can please come to the podium, you have three minutes. Elise Aikens, I'm 85 years old, senior citizen, People TV. Oh, I'm sorry, you're baby. Okay. Can't, can't, do I need to start all over? No, you're fine. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, People TV, Ms. Patricia Creighton has been here for us. Most of us are in wheelchairs and walkers. As I say, I'm 85 years old. Thank God I'm able to get here to speak for her. We need her. We know that she isn't being treated right by you or anybody else, but uh, she's here for us regardless of what you do to her or what you don't do for her. 
She checks on us to see if we need anything. If we want anything, she's there for us. We would like for you to continue to keep this lady on board for us. And uh, something else, oh, I'm having problems with my water meter. I've had a leak for two weeks. I do not have a cell phone or computer. I went to the school in our community to study computer and cell phone, and I couldn't do anything but turn them on and off. So I do not own that. When I call in with a water leak, I hold on for 15, 20, 30 minutes, and I get hung up on. I had to have Miss Creighton call and report my water leak, and it's still leaking. Please help us. We need you, whether we're in a wheelchair and you can't see us, or we're here out of breath. Thank you. Hello, hello, ma'am, ma'am, hello, ma'am, you, you, you are, you are in the right place today. We have all the top folks at Watershed here. Um, our commissioner is here, our assistant commissioner, and Mr. Jonathan Williams are here, right there. Hallelujah. Mr. Williams, Hallelujah. you raise your hand. Look at, him. look at Mr. Thank you. you can see him. You can see him very shortly. Mr. Williams, can we get someone to help her? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Boone. Thank you, Ms. Aikens, um, for coming today. Um, our next speaker is Ariel Unique Robertson. Did I, did I get your name correct? It's okay. A real. A real okay. unique. Hi, everybody. So I'm here on behalf of People TV as well. Um, I'm actually new um, versus Mrs. Atkin. I'm 24 years old. <laughs> So um, when it comes to what People TV has done for me, because that's what I wanted to speak about, um, People TV has actually opened my perspective. Um, being a youth and being a member of the community, I've been trying to find my way in the entertainment. You know, it's been kind of hard trying to figure out, you know, if I want to hit the big people or if I want to hit the community or what target I want to reach when it comes to just unifying the community, because that's essentially what I want to do. And what I've seen People TV does is definitely unify the community. Um, you've seen now the age range is different with People TV. The content is different with People TV. And I believe that with you guys' help, we could get the resources or the um, connections to be able to find different things to help People TV. Um, what I want to know or what I would like for you guys to help as a community member, what could we do as the community to help People TV? Um, I've heard a lot of things commonly like the community can give back or the community give back. And I know we're here to talk about what you guys can do but what could the community do as well as what you guys can do? So that's kind of the resolution I want to know as far as what People TV is gonna be from now on. And also just um, helping me, you know, as a young filmmaker in the mecca of film, that's one of my stepping stones. And to find out, you know, the stepping stone is either gonna be gone or the stepping stone is not as high of a step, it's still a stepping stone to me nonetheless. So I'm just here to get some kind of answer, some type of resource. What can we do or what can I do as a member of the community to help People TV to keep them alive so that way more content, whether it's for the youth, for the children, for um, our elderly in the community, what is it that we can do to keep that alive? So thank you guys so much for hearing me out and I'm here for People TV. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate your comments today. Um, next, we'll have Rhonda Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong, you'll have three minutes. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good morning. Good. Good morning. Awesome. So my name is Rhonda Armstrong. I'm the television director, station facilitator, and training workshop instructor at People Television. I was given the opportunity by Miss Patricia at People TV as I've been in the film and production industry for a while, doing live events and different shows throughout Georgia and around other states. 
as many people are aware, when you're doing film, television is a different uh, beast to tackle. And a lot of times, television companies, they won't give you an opportunity if you haven't had experience in television specifically. And Patricia, Ms. Patricia allows people to have that opportunity. So as my resume showed that I have a bachelor's in film and television, I have a master's in marketing and um, management, it showed no television experience. And she said, you know what? You can come on. I'm here and I have the opportunity for you. We may not have all the resources that you're used to seeing when you're out in the field and out doing other productions, but we're making it work. We're making sure that we give people a voice. We're making sure that we're giving people a chance and an opportunity. I also work at Salem Bible Church in my AB department. So I'm always happy to share the good news of Christ. I have my own apparel line after Christ. So I'm sharing the good news of Christ wherever I go. And this platform at People TV, because we're able to speak freely about what we, what we believe in, I can get on People TV and I can produce a show and I can share the good news not only in my community, but I can share the good news through streaming and other digital platforms. I also instruct other people because I have a background in media production and I have my bachelor's, I'm able to give training to other individuals that don't have the opportunities that I had, that don't want to go to two and four years of college and, and waste that time. Not saying that it was a waste of time because like I said, I have my degree and I have two degrees. However, when you don't have the opportunity and you don't have the finances to go to college and you don't want to spend that time, People TV gives you that opportunity. I've been able to see the smile on people's faces that are young and old alike, and they have the opportunity to become a producer. They have the opportunity to create their own shows. They have the opportunity that they weren't given previously. And they can come on and they can have a voice. And that is what People TV is doing. That is what Miss Patricia is about. We're trying to make sure that we people have the training, people have the education, people have the experience to go on and do better things that they may not be able to do in other organizations. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Richard Hertz. Thank you, Mr. Hertz. You'll have three minutes. God is good all the time. All right. We ain't dealing with heathens. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Security Officer Richard Hertz. You can call me Dick. I would like to yield the rest of my time to Sister Patricia, if that is all right with you. So, Mr. Hertz, um, one second, I'm just trying to see that you follow the proper procedure of deferring your time. Um, unfortunately, this would have had to, you would have had to sign up and defer your time to her on the list. Okay. Um, because that, you didn't follow the procedure, we can't do that. But um, I don't know if Ms. Ms. Creighton signed up. Yes, I did. Okay. Well, when we get to you at that time, we'll, we'll, we'll let you speak. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hertz, would you like to continue? Uh, yes, sir. Um, okay. I will say this. Um, myself... And my cousin, we have been shooting a few shows at People's TV for a few months now. Um, Sister Patricia is a wonderful woman. Uh, she's given us an opportunity to be creative. She's given us a platform to express our creativity. Um, it would be a shame if anything were to happen to People TV because People TV gives, gives certain opportunities to people. You know, and whether you want to make it big, make it small, whatever the case, public access is one way to go. People's TV, hey, we need it. And that's all I want to say. Thank you, Mr. Hertz. Uh, next, we have Earth Web. How y'all doing? Good. Good morning. Yeah, listen, um, I got three minutes. I'm gonna try to be as specific as possible. I would like to say that uh, it's one thing to talk about freedom of speech; it's another thing to implement it. At uh, People TV, people are able to create content without the worries of political or corporate agendas because they're not being paid to make the content. They can make the content 
that truly affects their community and be able to speak in a manner that is authentic to benefit that community. And I think to, to end that ability for them to be able to do that is a travesty in and of itself because in other public platforms, you don't have that opportunity because people's jobs are at stake. But when you're dealing with a situation like People TV, that's not the case. Me and my cousin do a news show here. And in this news show, we're not afraid to say what needs to be said in order to effectuate change. But if I was on WSB, I couldn't say the things that I'm able to say on People TV. And I think that needs to be taken into consideration seriously. Not looking as if we're just here standing up and we don't really have a um, power influence in this community because we do. Another thing is we're able to create content. And uh, if, we're, if we're in any way concerned about the younger community that's coming up and we understand the advent of AI, we know that jobs are on the line. And a lot of times what's getting ready to happen is if you can't make a way to live online, you won't be able to live, period. So what they're doing at People TV is creating ways and teaching people how to not only make content from their computers or laptops, but from their cell phones. So they're, the, 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 the technological advancements that they're also implementing at People TV is a resource that these people would not be able to get otherwise. And I think before we discuss whether or not we need to end People TV, I think people need to come down to People TV and see what they're actually doing for the community and then make a proper adjustment. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, next, we have Della Brooks. Thank you. You'll have three minutes. My name is Della Brooks. I am the board secretary at People TV. Um, I came to People TV in 2013 originally. I moved from LA because I wanted to start get back into the industry. I was in the film industry, but I wanted to learn television. Um, unfortunately, I had cancer. Fought that for a couple years. Came back a couple years later. Miss P, the door was open. And the door was open. And I learned, I learned how to create television because the vision from taking it here to there is just amazing to me. And I've um, also taught the classes to teach after I learned and to see the people that gleam in their eyes when they see that they can come there and create their own creations and um, <clears throat> air it on, on television, something about television that excites people when you just say the word. And I see so much excitement in the people and the children, old and young, who are allowed this opportunity to come in and do something that they didn't think they could do. And we offer that to the community. I've seen many of people, it's many of people that's come through to People TV who are famous now, you know, and they started there. Because sometimes you just need that edge and that push to know that you can do it because it's a dream when it's in your head. But once you walk in that, door and you can touch the cameras, you can touch the audio, you can touch the graphics, it brings it to a whole new light. And that's what the people need in the community. That's what the people love in the community. It is a television station for the elderly. Like Ms. Atkins, they don't go anywhere. They don't do much, but they watch people TV. And I just want you guys to keep all that in mind and keep us on air. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, next, we'll have Craig Pendergrass. Thanks, Craig. You'll have three minutes. Good morning, and thank you. Um, first, first thing, I'd like to uh, commend uh, to you a resolution that is on your agenda today. It's uh, 23R3686, which is uh, sponsored by uh, Council Member Hillis and uh, also co-sponsored by Councilmember Winston and Dozier and others not on this committee. 
Um, it is, uh, I, I formerly was on the uh, Georgia Advisory Board for Trust for Public Land, which is deeply involved in the Chattahoochee Riverlands Project, was on the founding board of Groundwork Atlanta, which was, uh, had a focus on this part of Northwest Atlanta and a particular focus on uh, the better use of the land that's the former Hartsfield incinerator. So this resolution is setting the stage uh, for um, having that land be have the, its best use, which would be uh, in connection with the Chattahoochee Riverlands project. There are other places where the uh, mulch facility could be located, and I just want to thank you all for introducing it and express my support for that. Um, second thing is I spoke with you all uh, several weeks ago, I believe, and then sent a follow-up letter that addressed the, what to do with the $493,000 of kind of found money uh, that came in and it's a reversion from the frontage fee solid waste action and the recommendation that it be earmarked. It's right now it's just in the general fund as a surplus, part of the surplus run, rollover from 2023. It was unbudgeted. Um, but to, and the, I determined that the $500,000 that was discussed earlier as having been allocated was for 100 of a special type of trash can that will be in really high demand areas. But there's still a need for additional trash receptacles on major arteries around the rest of the city to help with litter uh, reduction. That another thing that I've done over time was be on the board of Keep Atlanta Beautiful, and that was one of um, our big initiatives, was to get better coverage for trash receptacles to keep people from having to throw away things. So some people will throw away things anyway, but uh, I, not in the right place, but this would be a key component. And if you don't like the idea of trash cans, then allocate it to something or other that is related to litter reduction in this city. Thank you. Oh, and I, I do encourage a similar resolution to the one that's been done to, you know, to uh, direct DPW to do what you're asking them to do with the old Hartsfield incinerator to have that same resol sort of resolution giving your uh, direction to how to use that money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Pendergrass. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Ms. Patricia Creighton. Hello, everybody. I am a praying woman. So, dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you allow me to hold my peace this morning as Patricia Granny P. Creighton. Let me sit down and you come forth now. Amen. The people that have spoken on behalf of People TV here.
$1,000 a year, half of it goes to the rent. Do time is expiring. It's crazy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your comments today. Um, as I mentioned early um, before public comment, um, that we do have Mr. Brian Thomas here today um, from the director of the mayor's office of communications. Um, Mr. Thomas is going to speak to um, some of the concerns around public access television and uh, about an upcoming RFP. So, Mr. Sure. Thomas, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, council members. Um, so I can report to you that since uh, we last discussed, uh, we entered into a request for information to gain uh, the community's input on the future of community access media or public access television. Uh, I can tell you that that process ran from February through the end of March. Um, and I want to make sure I get those dates right. Um, in sum, we received about 151 pages of comments. Those are posted on our website, uh, atlantaga.gov slash community media. That includes uh, two public meetings that we held here at City Hall, uh, received uh, a lot of great comments and input. And as we've described since the beginning, that input is being used to inform the RFP for the future of community access media. Um, that RFP is currently with the Department of Procurement. We're working with them. Uh, it was our hope to have posted it this week. Uh, we're, we're, we're assured that it will be this month. Um, and so we're working through that process right now diligently with both Department of Procurement and Risk Management. Um, it is true that the contract, the, the current contract to operate community access media expired on June 5th with People TV. So at that point, um, the uh, feed was cut. Uh, we're currently uh, in the black, and it is our hope to move very quickly through this RFP, uh, select an operator, and, and get community access media uh, back on the air. Uh, I can tell you that from the administration, our, uh, we are deeply committed to this as a public resource. Um, we don't want the city to be in control of public access TV, as we've gone through in early iterations. That's not a desired outcome. So we're eagerly moving through this process. Very, very, very grateful for all the community members who participated uh, in that uh, RFI process to submit all this great information. We heard from some expert testimony, a lot of community members, uh, a lot of great written comments. And again, all of that's posted online uh, for anyone to, to read. Um, and uh, just wanted to describe, unfortunately, there's some things I can't go into here. I can tell you that that while we did look at a, an extension on the current contract, there were some extenuating circumstances that didn't allow for that in this case. So of course, that current operator will be able to apply under the uh, new RFP, uh, but we're, we weren't able to extend it this time. Happy to take any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, any comments or questions from my colleagues? Councilmember Boone. Yes, thank you um, for coming forward today. Question, who was responsible for informing them that they would go dark. Yeah, I, I sent a letter uh, the previous week, I think it was the Friday before, letting them know that the contract would not be renewed. Okay, but the, the contract being renewed is, is an issue. I think they knew about that, but they did not, if I'm hearing correctly, they were not informed that they would go dark. I believe we informed them at that time via letter, and I'll go back and check and, and can provide you a copy that the we'd be working with Comcast to uh, cut the signal at that time. Councilmember Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to, to add on to uh, Councilmember Boone's question, you say they had a, the notice went out a week prior to? I mean, yeah, so I can tell you that we were looking at right up until the last minute whether an extension would be possible. Uh, and so it, I would have loved to provide um, further advance notice. Uh, we had been in communication with the attorney. Um, but uh, ultimately, given those circumstances, we weren't able to extend. So we were able to provide that notice the week prior. It, it just, it feels to me a week isn't sufficient to yeah. allow folks to get their affairs to order or house to order or to be able to respond effectively. And so I appreciate that, that. that worries me a bit. And by a bit, I mean a lot. Thank you, Councilmember Dozier. Um, any other comments? Councilmember Shook. Yeah, if you could <clears throat> copy us on the notice that you sent out, uh, that would be helpful. Be happy to. Um, are you all in any form of communication with People TV or the attorney that I understand represents them? Uh, since providing the notice, I don't think we've received any further uh, correspondence that I'm aware of. 
that be because of the extenuating legal situation that you alluded to? So not, not quite. Um, I can tell you that um, once we enter the RFP, there will be uh, significant restraints on the, on the conversations between the city and any applicant. Uh, but since that RFP is not posted yet, that's not the case. Okay, so the channel uh, is not broadcasting. And so tell us about the underlying contractual obligations. Does, does the fact that sure. they're dark you know, violate uh, any, anybody's contract? Sure. So under the uh, uh, franchise agreement with Comcast, which again is posted on our website, um, there's uh, a three-month grace period where the channel can be dark and not providing content before Comcast would have the ability and the right to reclaim that channel for themselves um, and for, for their own use. So. Right now, no, we're not in breach, uh, but it is our hope and intention to move through this RFP process expeditiously so that we don't reach that point. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Shook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, you know, I think I share some of the sentiment from my, my colleagues, especially around um, the communication aspect. So we'd love to make sure that we're um, given an opportunity to see some of the correspondence that was sent uh, to People's TV, uh, just to make sure that we can have some follow-ups with them. I know I have, uh, I think, some scheduled meetings with um, some of the personnel from People's TV coming soon and just want to make sure that we have, you know, all that we need to be able to have constructive conversations around the, uh, the next. And um, just want to make sure that, you know, we seem to be on the right track uh, to make sure that that blackout period, um, we aren't in breach of anything and that we feel confident that, you know, an RFP will be in place before that contract expires. Um, that was a question. Um, do you feel like that's going to happen? I do believe so. Again, working with procurement just to make sure all those pieces are, are posted. Um, we'll need to make sure that they're qualified applicants when they apply, uh, go through that review process. I can tell you from the administration side, we're absolutely committed to moving through that process as, as quickly as we can while making sure we get this right. Uh, and I think uh, our actions so far demonstrate that uh, the, the process um, that has happened in the past has done so, has, has happened without community input, frankly, which is why it was important for us to take this year, uh, go through this RFI process and have a truly uh, community informed plan put together. Uh, the RFP that uh, will be issued uh, is, is greatly informed directly by those comments that we received. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, and, and are hopeful that uh, we receive um, uh, strong applications to make sure that this vital resource is, is reactivated and in the hands of the community. And I think that's the most important piece. And if people still have questions, comments, concerns, um, who do they address those to? In, in sure. Theme? So we, we have posted the website, atlantaga.gov slash community media, where we posted all our publicly available information. Uh, our contact information is on that page. Uh, it's both myself uh, and Natasha Lee, the director of Channel 26, who going to be with us, I think, is working on the 26 broadcast issue as we speak. Um, so we're leading that, and then we have a number of uh, uh, other folks that are going to be part of the review committee. Again, I, I do want to clarify, once we do open the RFP, uh, given procurement code, there, there's a blackout period from, from when we are allowed to openly discuss except through that procurement process. So, uh, But that is detailed itself in the RFP to say that there's a, an official process requesting additional information and providing that back to potential applicants. Any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Mr. Thomas, I want to thank you for thank you. Uh, arranging to be here short notice um, to indulge the, the committee and as well as the members of the public who had questions today. So thank you okay, very thank much you for being thank here. Thanks, Colleagues, now we'll get on with our uh, consent agenda. Um, Mr. Johnson, I'll let you start with ordinances for first reading. Item number 1230-1313, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget an amount of $7,500,000.00 to transfer funds from watershed reserves for appropriations to add funds to the Niski Lake Dam Repair Phase 2 project and for other purposes. Item number 2, 1314 an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget in amount of $1 million and zero cents to transfer funds from the watershed reserves for appropriations and add funds to the Niski Lake Culverts Project and for other purposes. Item number 3, 2301315, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget an amount of $1,740,000 and zero cents to transfer funds from watershed reserves 
for appropriations to add funds to the various supervisory control and data acquisition system improvements project and for other purposes. Item number 4201316, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget in amount of $2,900,000 in zero cents to transfer funds from the watershed reserves for appropriations to add funds to the AIM various upgrades project and for other purposes. Lastly, item number 5230-1317, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget an amount of $3 million and zero cents to transfer funds from watershed reserves for appropriations and add funds to the large and small meter installation and repairs project and for other purposes. This takes us to our regular agenda, Section G, ordinance for second reading. Item number 6, 2301273, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes budget and amount of $10 million to transfer funds from the Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Co Commercial Paper Notes for appropriation to add funds to the annual sewer contract project and for other purposes. And Mr. Chair, this item needs to be substituted. The substitute increases the funding amount from $10 million to $20 million. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I'll bring forth the motion to uh, bring forth the substitute. Second. Second by Hillis. Can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The substitute is before you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Browning. Good. Good morning, Chairman Winston, Council Members, Makita Browning, Commissioner for Department of Watershed Management. Purpose of this legislation is to amend and appropriate funds for the annual contracts for sanitary sewer repairs and the amount requested for contracts A and B, Ruby Collins, SE Consortium Joint Venture and Rockdale Pipeline IMS Joint Venture. As part of the ongoing initiative to meet the requirements of the federally mandated uh, consent decrees, uh, DWM is continuing efforts to renew and replace critical aging infrastructure within separated and combined sewer areas. The contracts and funds will assist DWM with on-call infrastructure re repairs and rehabilitation construction services to support uh, addressing emergency and priority sewer infrastructure repairs, as well as provide supplemental support to the Office of Linear Infrastructure Operations as needed. A few notable projects that the contracts are currently assisting with include the new Adams Drive um, sewer realignment, which is uh, complete and restoration is wrapping up. Uh, the Crock Street Tunnel, uh, phases one and two, which are sewer water and stormwater improvements to alleviate flooding in the combined area, as well as the North Buckhead went all down improvements project. So they've got several projects that are underway uh, and they're continuing to support the department adequately. Um, so far, their performance has been satisfactorily. Uh, so uh, that concludes my remarks. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Brownie. Any questions or comments? Uh, Council Member Shook. So when this paper was originally, I guess, drafted, the amount was 10 million, but now it's 20. So what, what happened? Was the 10 million a mistake to begin with? Or just so we initially budgeted 10 million. Uh, we increased it to 20 um, because they've got a lot of active projects underway. Um, we've seen some cost escalations due to market conditions. Um, so we want to make sure we got the bandwidth to support all the work that they're doing. They're going to be doing under fiscal year 24. And just in general, off the top of your head, <clears throat> to what extent are you seeing inflated costs for projects com compared to, say, a year ago? Is it 10 percent greater? We're seeing somewhere between you know, 10 to 30 percent. Materials? Materials, yes. Um, this, this contract also is supporting um, some of the stormwater projects as well. We're down to one um, contractor. Um, so, but yeah, they're, they've got the bandwidth to support in all fronts from a linear standpoint. I'll move approval on substitute. Thank you. We've got a motion to approve on substitute by Councilmember Shook, a second by Hillis. Can you please open the vote, Mr. Johnson? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The item is favorable on substitute. Mr. Chair, there are, the department requests to take item number seven and 13 together as a block. If there is no objection to me, we can take those items together. Yes, please proceed. Item number seven, 2301274, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Waste Water Renewal and Extension Fund budget in amount of $6 million and zero cents 
to transfer funds from watershed reserves for appropriations and add funds to the program management services team project and for other purposes. Item number 13-230-1280, in ordinance by City Utilities Committee to ratify services render in connection with agreement FC9838 Program Management Services with Stantec SG Joint Venture beginning May 1st, 2023, through the ex execution of the Sixth Amendment to authorize the mayor's designee to execute the Sixth Amendment to the agreement on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management to extend the term of the agreement on a month-to-month -month basis for a period up to 12 months, retroactively effective May 1st, 2023 through April 30th, 2024, to add funds in the amount not to exceed six million dollars and zero cents. All contracts work will be charged to and paid from the fund department, organization, and account numbers listed herein and for the purposes. Browning. Good morning, Chairman Winston, Council Members, Makita Browning. Uh, the purposes of the piece of legislation is to approve additional funding for and to extend a term of contract FC 9838 for a program management services team provided by Stantec SG Joint Venture on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management. Program Management Services Team provides on an as-needed basis professional program management services to assist DWM with capital improvements program addressing consent decree regulatory requirements through the Clean Water Atlanta program and other departmental uh, strategic initiatives. The PMST has supported the department for nearly two decades to deliver projects in compliance with the original consent decree and the first and second amendments. Additionally, the PMST provides other specialized technical and support with value engineering, support for the Department of Watershed Management strategic initiatives while developing management processes and tools. Some of the basic services that the PMST provides in addition to the CIP management and administration regulatory compliance or hydraulic modeling support, project controls and delivery, and information systems management. Contract was executed with a term of three years, effective in 2017 through 20, July 30 of 2020. They had a two year uh, Vendor outreach. A uh, vendor informational session was held at the end of April. It was well attended. We had over 100 vendors to attend. Uh, DW will proceed with procurement phase, the resolicitation next month. The additional time will allow the current team to complete work in progress relating to the assembly of remaining consent decree packages uh, pending procurement. The planning efforts relating to DWM's biosolids and zero waste initiative and propose updates to DWM's various fees and also forthcoming updates to the post-development stormwater ordinance and the stormwater utility road map and fee um, structure. And it'll also allow um, time for potential transition should the current incumbent team not be successful with the recompete. Uh, subject to your questions, that completes my review. Thank you, Commissioner Brownie. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Dozier. Uh, I'll second that. Uh, just real quick question for you, Commissioner. You had mentioned the post um, development storm water ordinance changes. I know I was on some of those task force meetings last year. I was curious if y'all had a timeline that um, y'all are thinking about with regards to when. Uh, summer, current summer, we are um, polishing off some of the proposed updates to the ordinance uh, that we'll look to bring forth um, late summer. Um, this summer. This summer. Okay. This summer. Um, that'll include the what's proposed for the extended detention time. Um, and then also we're, we're working with them on the potential, the stormwater utility fee structure. So. Okay. And I'll, I'll be curious to, to see, uh, I know there was a discussion two, three years ago as far as making these changes. So what differences, if any, are 
what this new proposal versus what uh, was discussed a couple years ago, but I'm, I'm glad we're moving in this direction. We're moving along. And I'll, and I'll second Councilmember Boone's Thanks. motion. So we had a motion by Councilmember Boone and a second by Dozier. There are no other questions. Um, can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. These items are found favorable. Item number A, 2301275. In ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget in amount of $500,000 in zero cents to transfer funds from watershed reserves for appropriations and add funds to the advanced metering infrastructure project. And for the purposes, Mr. Chair, this item need to be substituted. The substitute increases the funding amount from 500000 to $1.4 million. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I'll bring forth the motion uh, for the substitute. Second by Hillis. Uh, can you please open the vote? The vote is open. Good morning, Chairman Weston. Council members. Good morning. Um, Deputy Commissioner. The vote is closed. Oh, sorry. Five days, zero days. <laughs> one second. Substitute before you. Hang tight. One second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Now, okay. Thank I'm you. sorry. I'm, uh, I apologize. My apologies. Um, there again, good morning, um, good morning, Chairman Winston, other council members. I'm Deputy Commissioner Hugh Smith uh, from the Department of uh, Watership Management, Office of Customer Care and Billing Services. Um, I'm excited to bring this legislation to you um, to get started on the pilot project for our AMI program in the Department of Watershed Management. The purpose of this program is to bring our current metering technologies into a more advanced state. Um, some of the goals of that would be to engage customers from a more um, informative format, to eliminate some of the estimated reads, and um, just to improve the overall efficiency of the uh, metering department. Uh, trying to move more into a smart um, utility format as we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, any questions or comments from my colleagues? Got a motion to approve by Shook, a second by Hillis. Um, I do want to talk about the timing of the rollout. Okay. Can you speak a little bit to that? Okay. Um, currently, there again, we're in the um, evaluation phase of the actual RFP. It has not been posted yet. Um, I'm assuming through the purchasing process, you're looking at at least three to four months. So primarily, this would be more of a FY24 or into the fiscal year 24 program. Um, I would say it's going to take about six to eight weeks from the start of, I mean, from the projects initiated till we actually get into the pilot. So maybe summer or fall of next year, we'll come back with the findings from that pilot project. Thank you. I think we all share your excitement around this. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, we had a motion by Shook, a second by Hillis. Can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The item is favorable on substitute. Item number 9, 2301276, in ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to bring the FY 2023 water and wastewater renewal and extension fund budget in the amount of $2,030,000 in zero cents to transfer funds from watershed reserves for the appropriations and add funds to the warehouse labeling and barcoding project and for other purposes. Good morning, Stafley. Chairman Winston and Council Members. Daphne Rackley, Deputy Chief Information Officer. I'm also excited to come before <laughs> you today to talk about this money paper that's associated with allocating funds to um, support watersheds in warehouse inventory and barcoding um, effort. It mainly consists of funds allocated for professional services as well as infrastructure needs for this. There are seven warehouses um, across watersheds. So we're going to kick off with a pilot of the largest warehouse and then from there take lessons learned as we roll it out across the others. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from my colleagues? Question from uh, Councilmember Shook. Yeah, uh, refresh my memory. Did this initiative stem from a number of years ago, a lot of very unflattering issues about keeping track of inventory? Yes, it, it comes from an audit as well as just overall efficiency um, goals that Watershed has. So this effort not just looks at barcode scanning per se, but it's going to go and look at the inventory as a whole comprehensively, making sure things are categorized appropriately, labeled appropriately for tracking purposes. So it's a multi phase approach. And, but we're not just starting that process now. Oh, no. 
Oh no, it's, it's, it's picking up from efforts that have been done previously and coming back and a part of this is actually assessing what's been done thus far and making changes. So this, this funding that's allocated hopefully um, is definitely a not to exceed amount, um, but the assessment is gonna be a big part in terms of um, ensuring that it's done appropriately, but it's not a new effort. No, thank thank you. Councilman Shook. And uh, one quick question for me. I, I assume that the Department of Worship Management is not unique in terms of having high inventory. Are you all looking to roll this out in other city departments as well? The focus for this effort is the Department of Watership Management, but the, the technology that we're leveraging is something that is scalable to other departments, and we're having conversations from an IT perspective about the benefits the other departments can achieve as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, colleagues, I'll make the motion to approve. Second. Second by Dozier. Uh, can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. Item number 10-230-1277, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes budget in the amount of Two million five hundred thousand dollars and zero cents to transfer funds from the series 2021 water and wastewater mm -hmm. commercial paper notes for the appropriations and add funds to the valve and hydrant renewal and replacement project and other purposes. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, there again, good morning, Council Chairman Winston. Um, Hugh Smith, Deputy Commissioner, Office of Custom Care and Building Services, Department of Watershed Management. This legislation is to request funding for a valve and hydrogen replacement program. It's an ongoing program. The primary focus of that is to do uh, on-call repairs to inoperable valves and fire hydrants. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Got a okay. motion to approve um, by Shook, a second by Dozier. For the vote, can you please, uh, Councilman Millis. Thank you, Chairman. Are these uh, repairs, are they still all in-house, or are we balancing this with outside contractors, or who's performing the work? Primarily outside contractors. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five eight, zero. Nations, item is favorable. I was just going to make a clarification. Um, so we still have internal crews that are performing repairs to hydrants. We'll need the staff documentation from the contract to support, and then especially with the inoperable valves, that'll be contracted out. Well, as soon as we pass this paper, those SLAs are going to go up, right? <laughs> An ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes Budget in an amount of $2,200,000 to transfer funds from the Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes for appropriations and add funds to the Philip Lee Pump Station Bar Screens Upgrade Project and further purposes. Thank you. D.C. Fletcher. Good morning, um, Chairman Winston, Council Members. I am Quentin Fletcher, Deputy Commissioner for the Office of Water Treatment and Reclamation in the Department of Watershed Management. The purpose of this legislation is to request um, adding funds to the Philip Lee Pump Station Bar Screen Upgrade Project and for other purposes. The Philip Lee Bar Screen, uh, the, excuse me, the Philip Lee Drive Pump Station is located at 5235 Philip Lee Drive, Southwest Atlanta. The pump station has a firm capacity of 50.3 million gallons per day and pump wastewater flows to the Utah Creek Water Reclamation Center. Constructed in 1973, the Philip Lee pump station has a wet well and a dry pit shaft with non-clogged variable speed pumps controlled by a PLC. The two existing bar screens are operated manually and run continuously. Both bar screens are obsolete and are prone to fail during inclement weather. The Philip Lee 
um, pump station bar string upgrade project will remove and replace the existing two mechanical climber screens, control panels, belt conveyance system. Also, by upgrading the electrical connections, the new level transmitter in the wet well will control and operate the bar string automatically. This upgrade is needed to ensure reliable flow conveyance and operational efficiency. This project will mitigate overflows due to inadequate streaming capacity at the Philip Lee pump station. This request is critical as the city is required to meet the requirements of the NPDS permits issued by the Georgia Environmental Protection Division. Under these permits, the city is required to maintain critical system to meet discharge limits to protect the public health and Chatter Chattahoochee River water quality. Subject to your questions, that concludes my briefing. Thank you, D.C. Fletcher. Any questions or comments? Got a motion to approve by Hillis, a second by Dozier. Can you please open the vote? <coughs> the vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. Thank you. Thank you. Item number 12-230-1279, and an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget an amount of $1,500,000.00 to transfer funds from watershed reserves for appropriation to add funds to the lead and copper service and line abatement project and for other purposes. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, and Council Members, Nikita Browning. Purpose of legislation is to appropriate funds for the lead and copper service line abatement project. Uh, federal lead and copper rule requires the identif identification and removal of lead service lines. Lead and copper enters drinking water primar primarily through plumbing and piping materials. Exposure to lead and copper may cause health problems and issues. In 1991, EPA published regulations to control lead and copper in drinking water. And since 1991, the lead and copper rule has undergone several uh, revisions. In December 2021, EPA instituted revisions to the lead and copper rule to strengthen the framework on lead in drinking and removal of lead service lines. Systems are now required to complete a lead service line inventory by October 2024. The rule requires systems to monitor drinking water at the customer tap, and if lead concentrations exceed the allowable threshold, and more than 10% 10, 10 of customer tap sample, the system must undertake several additional remedial measures. The funds uh, being requested will be utilized to initiate procurement for a construction service that will complement the lead service line inspection pilot study that will identify and inventory lead service lines. This contract will address findings from the study and initiate the replacement or removal of identified publicly owned lead service lines. The privately owned lead service lines will be called to the property owner's attention and recommended for replacement as soon as possible. Um, so DWM will be utilizing the existing AE team to support with the pilot study and we will be proceeding with procurement to enlist the services of the general contractor uh, this summer. Uh, that concludes my remarks, subject to your questions. Browning, uh, Council Member Hillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Browning. So the service lines, those are the lines from the main to our side of the meter? Yes, from the meter to, our, to the main. So it's our responsibility to inform the customer if they have on their, their, on their side. side of the meter, but then it's up to them for replacement. Yes. Um, when do we expect to have the inventory or survey done? So we have um, just issued a task order to the AE um, within the past uh, two weeks to get them engaged. So they'll get started with their work this summer. Um, so it'll be a rolling process. I think it's going to take fully a you know, full year for them to complete the study and the um, inventory. And again, while they're doing their work, lines that would fall under this is it you know 80 not AD sure 20? i'll have to look back at some of the um the initial survey data um and asset data that we have i can get that to you what what percentage we think may be in a field thank you we've got a motion to approve by hillis a second by dozier can you please open the vote the vote is open Vote is closed, five yeas, zero nays, this item is favorable. This text takes to section H resolutions. Item number 14, 23R, 3686, 
A resolution by council members Dustin Hillis, Matt Westmoreland, Liliana Batiari, Jason H. Winston, Jason Dozier, Andre L. Boone, Antonio Lewis, and Michael Julian Bond requesting that the mayor or his designee direct the commissioner of the Department of Public Works to close the old Hartsfield incinerator yard waste mulching site because of the potential health hazard and nuisances it poses to the residents in the immediate surrounding neighborhood, requesting that the mayor or designee direct the commissioner of public works to identify a more appropriate alternative site for the operation within 90 days and relocate such operation to the identified new site within an additional 90 days, requesting that the mayor or designee direct the commissioner of public works to initiate and take the necessary actions to transfer responsibility of the old Hartsfield incinerator site to the commissioner of the Department of Public Parks and Recreation in alignment with the city's adopted Chattahoochee River lands plan and for other purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. We've got a motion to approve. Do we have anyone here from DW, DPW that would like to speak to this today? Okay. We have a second by Dozier. Good afternoon, Council. Um, Keith Robinson, Deputy Commissioner for Department of Public Works. I'm real familiar with the property that we're that's in discussion today. I met with the Main Street um, Homeowners Association. I think it'll be a great asset to the city. However, there are some things that we would like to hold for a little bit because there are some legal questions that we do have as it relates to the property as well, too. You know, number one, being on the heels of the lawsuit itself. Um, a, how did the property enter into the city? Number two, when we moved the facility, um, what impact is that going to have on our actual rates and the operational efficiencies um, as it relates? So there are a couple other things that we want to look at. Um, obviously, some of the nuanced nuisances, um, you know, we pulled reports from the EPD. Currently, there are no infractions of the location. And, you know, we looked at fire um, reports over the past five years. So those aren't some issues. But more importantly, we want to make sure we get it right. Because, you know, obviously, as the city expands, obviously, we want to make sure that, you know, from an operational standpoint and services and core services that we do provide to the city, that we also expand with it as well, too. So that's our main point is making sure we get it right. And also, as we move forward in terms of the time frame is we say 90 days, you know, we're going to be bumping up close to storm season. So right now, about 59 percent is used through DPW, 41 percent is used from parks and recreation. So we don't want to be in a situation if we close it too early that we're stuck with service delivery as it relates to yard trimmings. The other issue that we want to make sure, you know, that when we do go to the other facility, it's not just move a grinder and set it somewhere. We have to build a facility and there's the scales that's required for that. So obviously, hey, we would love that. That's a great asset to the city that we just want to make sure that we do it right. That's, you know, our main concern. Thank you, D.C. Robinson. Um, we have a, a motion to approve, a second by Doja. Do we, colleagues, do we have any comments or questions about this? Councilmember Shook. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping to learn that the department in the past has looked at this. I I'm, imagine this is not the first time the subject has come up. That so, is correct. Okay, so is there anything existing in terms of review or analysis that you can build on or are you starting from scratch? Well, I think our biggest challenge is finding an actual location to place the, um, the for a know, new site. Yeah, for a new site. Um, you know, obviously we want to look at maybe some potential existing sites that may be relevant as well too. I know there's some studies that we want to bring in Oasis just in case if we're able to put it in one of our closed landfills. Um, you know, that may be a potential opportunity but we want to make sure that we're able to place them in the, you know, in the right location. But the other thing is we have to look where it's centrally located as well, too, because there's windshield time as it's associated um, when we move the location as well, too. All right, well, I understand everything you've just said, and, and so I guess I'm heartened to know that you all are taking this seriously. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, my interpretation of what's in front of us here is, is that it's a, just a very kind of earnest and transparent yep. expression of our desire to work with the administration and to urge the administration to do what we can to be better stewards of the environment. So I will uh, await the principal sponsor's comments. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Hillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, Deputy Robinson, um, 
You're probably one of the uh, figures that's been in this with me the longest uh, under the previous administration. Um, as was alluded to uh, by Councilmember Shook and others, I mean, this has been going on since even well before I was a council member. Uh, I, I got involved in this as uh, just a neighborhood advocate back when I first moved to Riverside and became uh, that neighborhood association's vice president, eventual president. And I went, you know, hard for getting this, um, trying to get some effort behind this when I came on in 2018. And I've, uh, to say the least, not been um, impressed with the progress or lack thereof, even though I've been out uh, uh, with you when you were in a different role. I've been out with the previous DPW commissioner. I've been out with the current uh, DPW commissioner. I've been out with one of the current deputy COOs. Um, and there are really two things at hand here. Number one, uh, a lesser, uh, less serious one is that you know the city, this body has adopted the Chattahoochee Riverlands Plan, which is a 1.5 million dollar plan, again that we adopted, uh, that says you know this site needs to be reused and needs to be a parks asset. So it's going to be uh, probably the city's uh, main trailhead for the Chattahoochee Riverlands Plan. Um, and that's because it sits on, on, right on the state highway um, and on the Chattahoochee River. Um, again, that was a $1.5 million project, which the city contributed to, the Atlanta Regional Commission contributed to, our partner and neighbor, Cobb County, contributed to, and federal money from the USDOT. So if we're going to spend money and adopt plans, we need to carry them out. And Mayor Dickens has stated, uh, many times that bringing the city to its river and activating at least a portion of this trail by the World Cup in 2026 is one of his top priorities. Um, I've again met with DPW Commissioner Wiggins, DCO Otta on site. Uh, I think I've, as you mentioned, I think I've been with you and the previous uh, commissioner out to folks' homes that are affected by this site. Uh, and, and I've been with uh, Commissioner Wiggins to to those home sites, um, and it's it's time to get serious. You know, this council, I can't, you know, in a strong mayor city, I can't punch a button and have a site closed. But this is our effort to say that we're serious about this. Uh, things need to change. Uh, this is so. This two parts of this. One's the Chattahoochee Riverlands plan. Two is that this is affecting people's homes that live less than 150 feet from where the city grinds up all of its yard waste. Um, they can't even enjoy the outside of their homes because of the sound, because of the lighting at night, and most severely because of the material that comes on to their land from the, these operations. Um, so I would ask that my colleagues support this, as a number of them already have, by signing on as co-sponsors. Um, and let's get um, down. Uh, with identifying an alternative site, you know, uh, unfortunately, the, this came about in my last meeting, which the mayor instructed me to have with DCO Otta and Commissioner Wiggins, and I was told the reason it hadn't happened yet is because, quote unquote, there wasn't a mandate. Well, this is going to be the city council's mandate, and I would think that if the mayor says that it's one of his top priorities to bring the city to the river by 2026, it would also be a priority of, of our department. So. I hope that you all can, I know you all have been kind of outside of the loop in this, the Riverlands plan has been mostly planning uh, watershed and parks, uh, but you all are going to be an integral part of this too because you own, uh, well, the city owns and you all control this you know, roughly 12 to 14 acres, so only four of which are used uh, for this operation. So, you know, I respect your feedback, um, but, you know, this has been the same conversation for my six years on council. So, again, I would ask my colleagues to support this. Um, and let's get serious about finding a new location uh, for this work to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hillis. Do we have any other questions or comments? Um, seeing none, um, Mr. Johnson, we had a motion to approve by Hillis, a second by Dozier. Can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. Item number 1523R3708. 
a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor as designated to exercise the first renewal option for contract listed herein, annual contract for traveling screen service and repair with Atlas SSI Incorporated for maintenance and repair services on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management for a term one year effective August 9th, 2023 through August 8th, 2024 in amount not to exceed $600,000 zero cents. All contract work will be charged to and pay from the fund department organization and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Back D.C. Fletcher. Good morning again. I'm Quentin Fletcher, the um, Deputy Commissioner for the Office of Water Treatment and Reclamation. The purpose of this legislation is to request authorization to renew and add funding to agreement FC 1190453 with Atlas SSI Incorporated for maintenance, service, and repairs on traveling screens and bar screens and the amount not to exceed $600 thousand dollars and zero cents and for other purposes services are requested for the maintenance performed on traveling screens and bar screens these units which um, filter leaves sticks vegetation and other debris from the water preventing damage to our critical raw water pumping operations provided on this contract will include preventive and corrective maintenance per the operational equipment maintenance recommendations for periodic screening adjustments and inspections as needed. Repairs require replacement of worn or damaged parts as needed, and in some cases, complete removal and overhaul of both units. DWM has submitted a 90-day extension request that will expire on August 9, 2023. Uh, my previous legislation replaced the bar screen that's obsolete at Philip Lee this legislation actually provides services to all of our other bar screens and traveling screens throughout our DWM water and wastewater treatment facilities. Subject to your questions, that concludes my briefing. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions from my colleagues? Got a motion to approve by Shook, second by Hillis. Mr. Johnson, can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed, five yeas, zero nays. The item is favorable. Thank you. Item number 1623R3709, a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the City of Atlanta on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management to donate to a parking space at the City's water intake facility to Chattahoochee Riverkeeper Incorporated, a nonprofit 501c3 organization pursuant to section 6-306 of the City of Atlanta's charter to support the Chattahoochee River Keeper in furtherance of its mission to educate, advocate, and secure the protection and stewardship of the Chattahoochee River, including its lakes, tributaries, and watershed, and for other purposes. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chairman Wilson and other committee members, Reginald Wells, Assistant Commissioner, Watershed Management. This particular item is um, for us to ultimately uh, allocate a parking space for the upper uh, Chattahoochee uh, keeper to park their boat. We also have a um, similar boat. We support each other mutually uh, on the river as well as protecting what is very important to us, our uh, sole water supply source, uh, the Chattahoochee River. We also um, would like to uh, just partner with them on their mission to educate uh, and protect. The, um, the department at times when um, assessing near our river intake may get stuck or any other vital uh, infrastructure. They'll actually support us, respond accordingly. We also do the same, so it's important that we have uh, uh, mutual support and uh, commitment to each other. For that, I ask you guys to approve. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a motion to approve by Councilmember Boone, Second. seconded by Hillis. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, Mr. Johnson, can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. For our last item on the agenda, item number 17, 23R3743. A resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor as a need to exercise a third renewal option for sole source agreement listed herein, info water software licenses, training, and annual support agreement with 
Innovise LLC on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management for a term of one year effective July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024, an amount not to exceed $142,090.80. All contract work will be charged to and pay from the fund department organization and account number listed herein and for other purposes. Good afternoon. Good morning. Daphne Rackley, Deputy Chief Information Officer. Um, coming here to talk about the last renewal option for the Innovise Info Water suite of applications. Um, Innovise has been used since 2015 for hydraulic modeling as well as simulations for both our sanitary as well as our drinking water distribution um, systems. Um, it's used primarily by Watershed's Office of Engineering, but it benefits a whole host of other areas, including law, permitting, GIS, um, fire um, and rescue, as well as aviation. Any questions? A question or comments from my colleagues? Move approval by Shook, second by Hillis. Mr. Johnson, can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed, 5A0, nays the item is favorable. Mr. Chair, that concludes our legislative items for today. Thank you, colleagues. Before we um, open it up for general remarks, um, I just wanted to let you all um, make you all aware that in your committee handout package, there are a few requested items that were from this committee. Uh, one is attaching a memo providing a response to Councilmember Dozier's request for DPW to provide costs for additional trash cans per household, and uh, Councilmember Hiller's request from DPW um, on their current staffing le levels. Um, those are in that handout. There's also some miscellaneous items as well. Uh, just wanted to make sure that you all had that before we move on. Uh, Councilmember Hillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Deputy Robinson, um, issue, long-standing issue came up in Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee yesterday about the status of backlogged repairs uh, with fleet services. And so wonder if you could give us a rundown, an update of, of where we are with that and uh, any improvements we're seeing, what, what steps have we taken, what are we going to take to get uh, some of these vehicles back out to our city departments? No, 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 that's a great question. I think um, as we look at, you know, in terms of the APD vehicles um, that are backlogged, um, obviously, um, you know, we do receive a report twice a day on the number of vehicles that are shopped. Um, one of the things that we did notice over the past four weeks, there was an uptick in vehicles coming into um, fleet services, and part of that was due to the uh, AC units in some of these vehicles. So those are being repaired. I'll um, give you an idea uh, from the report from yesterday that I looked at. We know we had about 91 vehicles that were out this morning. There are about uh, 82 vehicles, so there was an improvement there. Um, now, when we also look at the number of vehicles that are out as it relates to uh, APD vehicles, you know, 30% of those numbers out of that 82 are actual accidents, so which is out of the scope of our work, but those are some of the things um, you know, that is also contributing to that, that number. Now, in terms of the improvement that we'll see is, you know, obviously we do have an aging vehicle. So as some of the newer vehicles that were actually purchased, those are being upfitted right now. So as more of those vehicles begin to come into, the, you know, into use uh, with APD, you'll see a lot of those numbers begin to, um, you know, those numbers will begin to improve as well. Now, in terms of citywide, um, obviously there have been challenges as it relates to um, hiring technicians. So what we've done is hired a third party to go out and recruit for us, um, not just us. I mean, the Department of DPW is having those problems, but that's a citywide issue as well, too. Um, so, so those are some of the things that we're looking at. Um, in terms of the actual improvement. Um, also, you know, we've got the team, um, you know, fleet they're working on, you know, some strategic planning as well, too, to improve, you know, service delivery as it relates to, you know, vehicles coming out. But I think a big portion of vehicles is probably the age of our fleet as well, too. So as we begin to acquire new vehicles, that's going to improve. But also, as we look at our parts situation, too, um, there's some strategies that we're working on right now as it relates to parts, because there's a national park challenges in the supply chain. So there's some things that we'll be bringing to the body fairly soon as it relates to some of those part strategies. What is the status of those vehicles that we do have to outsource to dealerships? As you know, this first got on my radar when I took my own uh, Ford to a dealership and saw just a parking lot full of APD, Fulton County Sheriff, Atlanta Watershed vehicles just parked in their lots awaiting service. Uh, how are those dealerships performing? 
Um, what we find is some of the dealerships are struggling. And so one of the things that we've done internally is looking at how can we reduce our risk on certain dealers to begin to spread out the different dealers that we actually use. So th those are some of the things that we're actually looking at from a dealer standpoint. And one of the things, as you know, as you've seen us do on the um, vendor scorecards as it relates to solid waste right away, we're doing the same exact exercise as it relates to some of our outsourced partners as it relates to the vehicle. So that way we can begin to look at the performance of different vendors. And then we also will be able to d dive a little bit deeper into the type of um, repair that different vendors may do great work at. Some may be great at transmission, some may be great at something else. So that gives us a, a better idea when we do outsource that we'll have a clearer line of path of who do we want to outsource with and also looking at their lead times and returning vehicles back to us. Uh, another question is, and you know, you never know until you're until you, until you ask. But um, I had gotten word uh, from a city employee that they had taken their vehicle uh, in for service, and they had received the comment back. And this was probably a week or two ago um, that they tried to take take their vehicle in for service, which I would assume would be an in-house repair. It was. You know, wheel bearings or something like that um, and they were told the statement uh, I don't know if it was just a frontline worker or a supervisor at, at fleet services that the city wasn't performing any more uh, fleet repairs until the new fiscal year and you that, that's news to me and I've got um, director um, deputy director here as well who's shaking his head that's not not the actual case so and I think that's something if we, we'll have to dig in and make sure that messaging, that, that should not be mentioned at all. So you in-house, we are continuing. Yeah, we're in-house. Yeah, we're still repairs. doing, we're performing maintenance in-house. Yeah, we're doing quite a bit of maintenance in-house. As I'm, I'm looking at the Hoping that wasn't the case given we're, no, no, time, no, no. we were three, three no, weeks actually, left in the fiscal year. And we, you know, you know, I see those reports and how many vehicles we have in the shop. And yep. I was a little uh, taken aback by that. So I'm, I'm glad that's not the case. And just lastly, just a request, if you could uh, send me an update uh, particular to, since they're so so numerous, uh, the current status today, any reports you have on APD and AFRD vehicles. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We can, we can have that team put that together for you, no problem. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, yes, questions? Yes. Councilmember Boone. Yes, I would just like to ask for condolences for the family of the Honorable um, Derek Bozeman, Yolanda Bozeman, and Vicki Bozeman, and their mother who tragically lost their brother, Michael Bozeman, in a car accident over the weekend. Let's keep this family in our prayers and wrap our arms around them at this time. Um, Michael Anthony Bozeman passed over the weekend. He attended Price High School and just a great legendary family in the city of Atlanta. Thank you. Councilmember Boone. Any other comments or questions? Thank you all for a very spirited City Utilities meeting today. We stand adjourned.